Inita tiene estudios eh, de diferentes escuelas, entre ellas Sweet Bar College por matemáticas y ciencias computacionales y música. En la Universidad de Duke por musicología y en la Universidad de Purdue por un PhD eléctrico y de ingeniería computacional. Es una investigadora ingeniera agricultora del de Departamento de Agricultura de Estados Unidos. Ha hecho uh, investigaciones para el servicio de agricultura en Kearnesleyville West, Virginia, donde, ha sido donde se ha comprometido a crear sistemas de, automi de automi automatización investigación ha encontrado interés por los campos y por la visión computacional y robótica en una dimensional particular. Ok, now you can start. Thank you. Ok, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to be talking, uh, well, I'm going to be giving a presentation in a way in two parts. The first part, I'm going to be describing a technical committee that I co-chair called um, AGRA or the Agricultural Robotics and Automation Technical Committee. And then I'm going to be talking about my research program at the US Department of Agriculture. So first, my workplace is a really long acronym, uh, so I'll explain uh, that. So first, it's the US Department of Agriculture is the, the department. And then within that, the agency that I work for is called the Agricultural Research Service. So uh, the people who work there, we don't have any teaching responsibilities. I have a research scientist job. And then within the Agricultural Research Service, The labs are spread uh, throughout the US and usually each lab has a specific focus. Uh, so the focus of the lab where I work is on temperate tree fruit. So, uh, well, temperate fruit, I'm sorry. So I work on things like um, apples, peaches, pears. Uh, there's been some work on cherry and then small fruit like strawberry, or uh, blackberry or blueberry. So uh, subtropical fruit like citrus is not included in uh, this particular uh, lab. It's too far north for that. And so the location, um, as Carla said, is in West Virginia, which is uh, where I am is about two hours drive from Washington, DC. This is what it looks like. So we're in a a sort of rural zone and uh, we have the lab with greenhouses right next door uh, attached to it. And then we also have a research farm so we can do experiments on trees uh, right there, which is very convenient. And then we also have collaborators who are, um, have, uh, um, who are commercial growers so we can also do experiments with them as well. So I'll give you a little bit of um, background on the way I look at problems. Um, so I have training in computer engineering and computer science, and I'm really interested in getting uh, robust computer vision solutions to agricultural problems. And then I've also, since I finished my PhD, I've also been using robotics to help uh, get better computer vision solutions to uh, some of those agricultural problems. And I've been interested in estimating shape. So in agriculture, um, the shape of things is uh, unusual compared to the industrial world. So in the industrial world, you tend to know the shape of the object ahead of time, like the shape of a part in an automotive factory or um, a lot of the work in computer vision is on humans where they have sort of a, a, a shape that can be predicted, where in agriculture, it's, just, it's not as easy. 
So the overview of the talk is first, I'm gonna talk about this AGRA technical committee. And then I'm gonna discuss um, the one drone project I have because Marco invited me to give a talk and it's this, uh, a drone week. So I have to give a drone um, talk. And then I'm gonna talk about a long running project I have that incorporates computer vision and robotics on estimating tree shape and um, three dimensions. So first, um, how, like where does this technical committee fit in terms of IEEE? So I know that this conference is organized by an IEEE Ross chapter. Um, so IEEE is a big professional organization. Um, and within that, there are many uh, societies. Ross or Robotics and Automation Society is one of those. Um, and then within Ross, there are different boards. Um, one of them is the Technical Activities Board. And so the Technical Activities Board governs how the technical committees work. So technical committees are just uh, groups of people who have a common interest in certain topics. Uh, and so they can form uh, sort of uh, of their own will and then um, create a group within Ross and Ross supports them in that effort. So we are one of the Agricultural Robotics and Automation Technical Committee is one of many um, technical committees in Ross. There's probably 40 different technical committees. So our, <clears throat> our scope is to work on um, different topics within robotics and on automation to have safe, efficient, and economical agricultural production. And so that's generally within the agricultural automation and precision management or farming areas. But um, those areas overlap with a lot of other topics too. So uh, many people work on plant phenotyping or environmental monitoring as well. So because of that, uh, our members cover many different academic disciplines. So some of them are not electrical or computer engineers. They might be mechanical engineers or agricultural engineers or even plant biologists. And um, they cover different application areas too. Uh, so our, uh, we have um, five co-chairs and they're split up by the IEEE regions. Uh, IEEE regions are split up sort of by time zones. Um, so we have one in Europe at Wageningen and um, one in Australia and one in Japan and then two in the USA. So I'm one of the co-chairs. And all the technical committee work is volunteer. So uh, if you want to do something, you need to speak up and let us know what you wanna do. So this technical committee has been around since the late 1990s and over time we've grown to become uh, more large. So uh, now we have over 700 people on our mailing list. Uh, and what we do is we have a general community for events and um, positions through our listserv so if someone has a position in their lab and they want to send it to everyone else in the, um, in the technical committee, that's encouraged. Um, and also if you're host, like this event went through our listserv and we promoted this event. We also work, organize workshops at some of the robotics conferences. And uh, we had monthly webinars from our members. So someone would give an hour long talk and then answer questions. And that was open to the public. But since the pandemic, it seems like uh, there's so much that's online. Uh, there's, I haven't had anyone volunteer to give a talk. So I'm not sure uh, what the status is gonna be on that going forward, uh, but there's a lot of content online now. And we have all of our old webinars are, uh, that have been recorded are online on our website. And 
Speaking of that, our website is uh, IEEEAGRA.com. And that's how you can find out the most information about our technical committee. And then we also communicate with people through our email listserv. And we have a Twitter account too, which is AG Robotics TC. So here's an example of how we um, promote our webinars. This was um, Francisco Roviva Moss uh, from Spain. He had a project on uh, uh, grapevine monitoring. Uh, and then this is our website. Um, so if you wanted to join, the requirements to join is just that you have an interest in agricultural robotics and automation, and you don't need any memberships through IEEE or ROS to join and participate. So because of that, we have people from many different disciplines and we work with other organizations to promote their events um, so that our members can go to the things that interest them. Um, yeah, and then we also have people, you know, they, so they're working on an agricultural project now and they join and then say they get a job <coughs> in industry that's not agricultural, so then they, they can drop out and that's perfectly fine too. So if you want to join, the easiest way is to go to our website and then there's a join tab right there and then you'll fill out a Google form. Uh, and the most important thing to list there is your email address. And the second easiest way is to do a direct message on uh, the Twitter account, or you can contact me uh, and, um, and then I'll, but what I'll do is I'll just fill out this join form because that's the easiest way for me to remember to put everyone in the listserv. So the wrap up thoughts about the technical committee are that it's uh, international. So we have people from uh, on the last survey over 60 countries. Um, so, and agricultural is very regional. So if you change, um, you know, growing a crop in one country versus another, the conditions are all gonna change. So that's very, uh, causes some, you have some very interesting conversations as a result of that. Uh, and then it's also a volunteer. So if you have any initiative that you wanna start and that we can help you with just, um, you can let us know and we can, uh, we can support you in that. So then the next um, topic is this insect behavior monitoring with um, uncrewed aerial systems or drones project. So this is a project that is not all the way finished yet. So I'll just um, talk, talk to you about where it is now and the ideas behind it. So invasive insects, um, one that we've had in the US is called gram marmorated stink bug. And um, so invasive insects, just briefly, they come from uh, another region and uh, they have a negative impact to the region that they come to. So uh, entomologists have some standard protocols to figure out how new invasive insects are behaving in this new region. Uh, so that they can control them better. So this particular insect, the brown marmorated stink bug, it had a lot of negative effects to agriculture and the usual tools to um, control insects did not work very well. So they sprayed it with you know, the usual chemicals and it sort of was like whatever, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, so they had to really investigate what will it take to control this insect? So these are the regions where it's most of a problem. So this mid-Atlantic um, region of the US was the worst hit. And so this is sort of where we are, well, where I am rather. Um, and it uh, is worse on fruit crops and soybean. So one of the ways that entomologists go about studying Insects is to use mark release recapture studies. And so they, and one of the mark release recapture methods is to use a fluorescent powder. So they 
put a they put the insects in a bag and then they put the powder on the insects and they shake it up and then they release the insects at specific locations and then they try to go um, then they try to go find the insects and so finding the insects is considered the recapture uh, and then they record where the insect was found and analyze the behavior of the insect relative to the different um, environment where the insect was released versus where it was found. So this takes a lot of work from people and also they have to go uh, climb and um, be in machines to go up to see where they've been. So there's a lot of problems with this technique. And also they don't tend to find all the insects obviously because the insects can fly around and um, people can't. So uh, after a while, Kevin Rice, who's one of the entomologists on this project, he started using uh, UV focusable lasers to locate the insects better with, uh, with this um, fluorescent powder technique. So then he could be on the ground and he could find insects and trees better um, than with the short range flashlights that he was using before. So as a result of using that, he, ha he had the idea that um, we could automate finding the insects with a drone. Um, and uh, so that was the creation of this project. So in brief, we wanted to automate some of these behavioral studies with a drone. And um, so we're gonna use this mark release recapture approach and uh, with the fluorescent powder and UV light. Uh, so we'll need to put the UV light on a drone uh, so that we can shine it on the insects on the ground and acquire images and hopefully do all this autonomously. This is the first version of our um, drone with the UV lights. So we have a DJI Matrice 100 and um, we use a Zenmus uh, camera and um, here's the array of um, the UV lights. It was pretty heavy, so uh, the next version we had was a lot lighter and worked better. But it was, was able to illuminate all the way to the ground and the insects are very, very small. So that was a, a challenge was matching the camera settings with, um, with the LEDs such that you could illuminate an insect that's that small on the ground from the air. So this is what those, um, those insects look like when they're coated with the powder. And first we started with dead insects to make the problem easier. <clears throat> so uh, like I mentioned, we're starting with the ones that are dead. And the first experiment was that we laid out the insects on a grid and then we flew the drone over with uh, settings that, uh, that were optimized and then we uh, ran some computer vision algorithms to see if we could find the insects in the images. So this, um, at this stage of the project, that worked pretty well, and uh, we had a pretty good uh, precision and recall. So we have one paper out on this work. It's out on um, archive, so it's uh, free to access. But as I said, this is a project that's still ongoing. So then the next um, work I'm gonna talk to you about is estimating fruit tree shape in 3D. Uh, and for this project, the way I worked on it at first was very similar to the way people uh, create point cloud maps with drones, but for various reasons that didn't work very well. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. So the motivation for this project was um, was to create uh, ways to autonomously prune apple trees. So I'll just uh, run through the pruning of apple, apple first. So why would you do it? How and when do you prune apple trees? So for the why, on, uh, you wanna balance the vegetative growth of the tree with the reproductive growth of the tree. And I, ideally those are gonna be um, perfectly in balance to get the tree in optimal production. Uh, when the vegetative growth is too great, 
then the reproductive growth is going to be less. So you'll get um, really small fruit or not very many fruit at all. So if you're trying to sell fruit, then that's, um, that's not ideal. On the other side, if you have too much fruit or too much reproduction, then um, you don't have as enough photosynthesis going on and you'll deplete the tree's nutrients and the tree, uh, over time, if that continues, the tree is going to um, die. So then the when, this is uh, the type of pruning I was going to work on was, is called dormant renewal pruning. So it happens uh, in the winter when the trees are leafless. And uh, labor availability is a problem for this issue. So it's a seasonal job. So you can't employ people year round for this particular task. And then the how for dormant renewal pruning, I'll just do it really quickly. First, you identify what is the central trunk of the tree. And then you find a, the branch with the largest diameter and you remove that. And then you find the branch with the next largest diameter and remove that one. And then you continue finding the branch with the next greatest diameter. And then you stop when the tree is um, balanced. So um, there are some formulae for knowing when you can stop, but usually people who are used to pruning know when you need to stop. So my first steps for reconstructing the tree structure were really similar to what the pipeline is for estimating, um, for getting point clouds from drones. So doing some structure from motion technique where you get features and then find correspondences and then you can estimate the cameras and just iterating from there. Um, and then my idea was to identify branches, but in trees, the features are not consistent enough to uh, get that to work. So it's only finding five points on the whole tree, which is really not good enough to find uh, branches from there. So I had to throw that out. So in the end, um, what happened was I came up with this system that has a robot at its um, center for the data acquisition part. So first you acquire images with a robot and it has two cameras here. And then you have images from many different viewpoints from this robot. And then uh, there's a segmentation step. So in each image, each pixel is classified as belonging to the tree or not belonging to the tree. And you can see here that there are some errors, but that's, uh, that's okay if there's some error. Then there's the reconstruction step, which estimates the shape of the tree. And then extracting the structure. The, what I mean by that is uh, what, where are the branches, not just the the shape of the tree, but what are individual branches. And then from there, you can do measurements on that structure. Before any of that, though, you have to do a calibration step. Um, and that will be stable for a couple months. And if you change something with the cameras or the robot, then you need to recalibrate. So we have some different um, units. One, this is one of the this is a self-propelled unit. So um, some of these were built in-house and then we bought the lift and um, the slide and the robot. So we have the lift so we can adjust the height of the robot and experiment with that. We have a slide so that we can adjust the distance to the tree. And then um, the robot acquires images of the tree. Here is what uh, the robot unit looks like in the row with the trees. And then there's a blue background so that the uh, cameras are not looking at multiple rows of trees. This makes the segmentation step go a little easier. We also have an indoor system so that we can experiment with um, small greenhouse trees and also try out some ideas indoors without having to take everything outside. So this is what the image acquisition step looks like. And this one has two cameras, 
but because it's shaded, it's difficult to see that there are two cameras. So every time it pauses for just a little bit, it's taking an image with each of those cameras. And this sequence, uh, so the sequence of steps that the robot is taking is pre-programmed so that it generally works with most of the trees that I would encounter. And this takes a minute and a half per tree. And then it um, goes, the robot goes back to its home position and then we move the truck and the background. So then after um, acquisition and segmentation, then um, is, a, is the reconstruction step. So I used a voxel-based method, method, which is uh, you, uh, so voxel is like a, the 3D version of a pixel in uh, an image space. So you just um, divide the three-dimensional space into cubes. And so one of the negative points of voxels for this problem is that we have a really large space of a tree, but the features that we are interested in are very small. So I use the silhouettes um, for reconstruction or these, uh, another way of saying it is these uh, images, these black and white images that say where the tree versus non-tree regions are. So these are some examples of what they look like. And then I'm using this voxel-based approach for reconstruction. And so you can create a cost function that describes the amount of mismatch between the silhouettes you have and any um, labeling of the voxels as whether they have tree or not tree. In them. So that was um, a large part of what my PhD was about. As a re, um, and that worked pretty well, but uh, one thing I run, ran into was that with voxels, as I said, the search space, the space is really, really big, but um, what we're interested in, the branches are very small. So I used a hierarchical approach where I started with sort of larger than I wanted voxels, and then, um, then I uh, made them smaller. So at first I used, so this is an illustration of that process. So here the voxels are large at 40 millimeters. And then I run the search again in that neighborhood uh, with smaller voxels. And then I'm able to refine the reconstruction until we get down to 2.5 millimeter voxels. The next step is curve skeletonization to get the branching structure. And um, so the reconstruction part gives you um, just a labeling of which, uh, which parts of the space have the tree in them versus not. It doesn't tell you where are the branches, uh, which part is a branch versus uh, the, another part, which is another branch. Um, so, so what's needed then is uh, curve skeletonization and this, the surfaces that I had are like this, where they have a lot of noise, especially in the top. Uh, so I was looking at other methods in the literature that would do curve skeletonization. And the problem I had was that the existing methods work with really smooth surfaces like this one, um, like for games. And uh, they couldn't deal with all this noise. They had a lot of problems with all this noise. So that, the existing methods didn't work at all on my trees. Uh, so then I worked on how, to, how do you get the branching structure with noisy surfaces? How do you deal with that? Uh, and then I um, published that with a collaborator, Henry Medeiros. And that's also, that's on archive too. So you can look at that if you want. <clears throat> and it also works on these very nice smooth surfaces. So this is the result of going through all those steps. 
So on the left is um, an image of the tree and in the middle is the reconstruction step or the shape estimate. And on the right is the curved skeleton. So the different colors represent different um, segments of the tree. So it works pretty well uh, compared to the other things that were available at the time. And you can see in the middle that there's some things that are not part of the tree, but that gets filtered out. So, uh, and then the last part of the system was to do the measurements. Uh, so for the tree pruning problem, uh, the features that were of interest were the branch diameter. And here is where they do the measurements for the diameter branch angle and branch length. So to uh, assess how accurate the system was, we measured two small trees and then uh, compared that with how well the system, uh, compare that with the system's measurements. And these are the types of results we had. So under three millimeters error for diameter and length, the error was much larger because um, small, the ends of branches are cut off in the, um, in the computer vision system. And then the angle error is about 31 degrees. In terms of the, the computational time of running this, um, the thing that takes the most time is the reconstruction step. So that's most of the, uh, you know, almost nine minutes to do the, uh, um, do the whole process from segmentation to the measurement. So in the future, uh, the things that I would like to uh, improve on would be to find a way to remove the background and that would make it easier to get data if we didn't have to have the background. So ideas would be to use a deep learning approach to do the segmentation. Um, I've been thinking about ways to increase computational speed of the reconstruction. Uh, and then thinking about other applications for this kind of work, um, such as precision spraying. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, everyone who's worked on this project. So especially technicians, Scott Wolford and Larry Krim. So Scott Wolford built all the, um, all the robot units uh, he's a machinist in my program, and Larry Cram retired. He was um, a horticulturist who takes care of the trees, and many co-authors and collaborators who have worked on this as well. Are there any questions? Thank you, Amy, for the presentation. We are waiting for the questions. Oh, okay. Pueden empezar a hacer sus preguntas, pueden dejarlas en español y ya nosotras se los traducimos a Amy para que las pueda responder. One question. How can we start working with Agra Committee? As, um, as, the, as your student um, group, the um, Morelia group, or as individuals? First okay. as a student group and then as an individual. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think uh, just contact me with your ideas of what you would like to do. Um, I don't think we have any active committees right now, but especially if you want to give a talk uh, or anyone that's given a talk this week wants to give a webinar, and especially if it's in Spanish, because I've been uh, trying to encourage people to give talks in languages that are not English, um, that's very welcome. Um, but yeah, anything that you want to do, you can just uh, let me know. Um, there are some things that, I mean, uh, I haven't, I'm sorry, I didn't think too much about what people might do before this, but there are some things that I've uh, told other people if they want to help with, 
um, I can I can let them know, but more, I would be more interested in helping you all do things that would be uh, good for your professional development or that would help you um, do things that you're trying to get done and you need help getting them. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. One question in the chat is from Biko Rocha. What would be the cost of a smart burning in a garden? Oh, I don't know. Uh, there is a project on that in the UK. I think it's at Edinburgh. They have a smart pruner for hedges or something like that. Um, who worked on that? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think there's any commercial products now for uh, automated printing. And I don't think that it will be soon that there's automated printing. It's, a, it's still a hard problem. Will I have a question? I don't know if I can. I'm not very familiar with uh, agri agricultural um, topics, um, like an amateur right now. But I want to know, is it possible to administer some kind of insecticide or is it just useful for insect tracking? Uh, I missed one word. Is it possible to administer uh, what? Insecticide. Um, yeah, there have been some, uh, you mean with a drone? Excuse me, what? Okay, um, I'm not, I didn't hear all of your question maybe. Are you asking, is it possible to administer insecticide with a drone or, or was it some, with something else? No, yes, it was my question. If it's possible to use um, uh, an insecticide with the drones or if the drones are just useful for the insect tracking. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, the type of drone that I've been using is doesn't uh, the payload. So the amount of weight that you can carry is too small to use it to spray. But people have been using it to people have been using small helicopters to spray, and um, in uh, California maybe there have been some trials. And I have seen some article in China that they've been using um, large drones to spray. So it, and then they've been, they've used um, small aircraft to spray, you know, since the 1980s. So um, yeah, this spraying, aerial spraying has, I think is, is possible, um, but you need a larger unit than uh, many people have, and you need special, you know, the right permissions to fly it. I don't know what the rules uh, in Mexico are, but we need to, you know, there's a lot of, the regulations are always changing for drones. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Oh, I found this, um, the garden pruning robot. It's called the TrimBot 2020 for um, whoever was, I forget, Vika Roko, who uh, asked that question. Thank you. Okay. We don't have more questions, but you can pass us um, an email or some social media to contact you. Sounds great. Thank you.